Happy Sunday. We are coming to the close in the preaching series of Exodus, and there are about maybe two more sermons to go before we end Exodus. And I have been having some discussion with different people, and I've been praying about this. Uh, the next series of preaching I will be doing will be on the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this is because we have been preaching through many different series through the years. We did the Gospel of Mark. We did Galatians, we did 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we did 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Go back to Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, and now I think we should uh, go to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke is difficult because structurally it's a, a, a Gospel that doesn't flow like the Gospel of John. So many people will preach the Gospel of John. Maybe even the Gospel of Matthew, but very few people will take on Luke. But I believe that it is a very wonderful Gospel for us to study further. And I, I'm always very happy to be able to preach about our Lord Jesus Christ because that's what the Gospels are all about. And as you have seen through the many preaching series, God continues to use His Word to teach us and to help us understand Him a lot better. And like I said over and over again, that among all of the people in this congregation, I have been most blessed because I have to struggle with the word more than any one of you. So I actually will learn the most. So I really look forward to God continuing to lead us from this pulpit ministry. So let's review what was taught in the last lesson. Remember last lesson was a lesson which I said would be considered one of the most difficult passage in the whole of uh, Exodus, uh, Exodus 32. And even before I started the series of Exodus, I was already dreading coming to chapter 32 because it's such a difficult uh, chapter. It is difficult not because the event related is a difficult to understand thing. It is quite easy to understand. The whole gang of people went against God. Difficult for me because of the event that happened before that, right? We started with Moses on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights when he received the many laws and instructions from God relating to how the people of Israel should be managed. And then how the tabernacle is going to be built with all these very, very fine details. And we talked already about how God is a very precise God. And so all the very small detail was given. But what happened was that in the meantime, the people of God at the bottom of Mount Sinai, they revolted against God and they got Aaron of all people to make a golden calf for worship. And because of that, he incurred the wrath of God. And so chapter 32 was very simple that way. He incurred the wrath of God and Moses came down from the mountain, threw the Ten Commandments tablet on the floor, broke it. And then after that, instructed the people to kill each other. And all those people who were against God got slaughtered, more than 3,000 people. While the story is easy, the lesson behind it is extremely, extremely difficult to understand. And even after I finish preaching to you, I think I will spend my entire life thinking about this. Because the Israelites at the bottom of Mount Sinai were not your ordinary people. They were people who were witnesses to perhaps the most spectacular and the most number of signs and wonders in the history of mankind. Because I don't think you can find from the Bible any other people that has gone through so much. We're talking about about 2 million of them, more than 2 million of them, who has gone through all kinds of challenges in life and witnessed not just simple signs and wonders, but super and very, very big supernatural spectacular signs and wonders. And then Aaron, this person who is the brother of Moses, uh, he was the one who was personally involved in many of the signs and wonders himself. I mean, he was not just an observer, you know. He was a person that executed at least three of the ten plagues. So some of the signs and wonders listed were things like this. Uh, the ten plagues striking Egypt. And as you, we have preached through, right? Every single one of them is a big deal thing. Turning the water of the river now into blood. Whole thing, you know. All the whole river become blood. And if you watch the movies, right? Sometimes the alligator die and the fish die because everything becomes blood. The frogs, the flies, the sores on the animals, and finally the striking date of the firstborn. And then when they left Egypt, the pillar of cloud and fire leading them. You're talking about a huge phenomena in front of them and at the back of them as the Egyptian army come into pursuit. So the pillar of cloud actually blocked the army from them. 
and the most spectacular of them all to cross the Red Sea through the night. Not a five-minute thing, you know, through the night. For hours, they walked through the Red Sea as the sea departed for them and then after that, closed upon the Egyptian soldiers and killing them all. After they were journeying towards Mount Sinai, they got no food. God granted them manna from heaven every single day with quails for meat. And then when they had no water, Moses was able to get water from the rocks by sheer command. And they were attacked by the Amalekites and God delivered them. And finally, as they reached Mount Sinai, the awesome presence of God was seen. And we have read all that. Not only that, at the bottom of Mount Sinai, they began to affirm once again that they will honor God. And so for me personally, this is like the most difficult thing to figure out. So why would you, after going through all that, still revolt against God in such a horrifying 180 degrees turn around kind of manner? I think this is something that I must be very honest with you that I, for the rest of my life, I will have difficulty understand. So drawing lessons from this then, one of the things that is very certain is this demonstrates the unreliability of signs and wonders. Oftentimes, we think that if only we get to see a miracle from God, then we will surely be holy, uh, faithful, or whatever it is. Reality is that that's not the case. And yeah, not only for the Israelites, right? In modern day time, I have met some people who have gone through difficult time and God delivered them. But, you know, people quickly forget. So if they can forget, then let alone people like us. And not only that, the lessons also reminded us of the great teaching of reform understanding, which is the total depravity of man. Meaning humanity in reform understanding, we totally broken and totally sinful. The Bible says in Romans 3, none of us will seek after God. None will do good, not even one. And so that's a very stark and very fierce kind of a way to remind us. And so because of that, there is a need for us to have a healthy distrust of humanity, that you should not be so naive to think that everything is fine because people are good. And it, life will show you over and over again that there is a need to, for a bit of healthy distrust about humanity because we are all totally fallen, including the Christians. And the Israelites also demonstrated that there are great temptation when times are safe and God seems to be quiet because they have gone through all kinds of difficulty and they were waiting by the foot of Mount Sinai for Moses to come down. But, and so things are good, you know. And so when things are tough, remember that temptations could actually be higher than at any other time. And lastly, we see the key role of leadership or the lack of leadership at that place. Because Moses was away 40 days and night, and then they were then led by Aaron, the second kind of a leader who was really quite horrifying as a leader. And the people then began to go haywire. So I ended the sermon by talking about how it is important for us to know that we are called to lead in a world that is full of darkness today. And today I want to expand a little bit further on it. I want to remind you that when I use the word lead, I do not mean the CEO of a company or the camp commandant or somebody who is at the top. I'm talking about every single one of us who call Jesus Christ our Lord and our Savior. Because the Bible is very clear about this, that we are to be sought and light of the world. Take on a leadership role wherever we are. I mean, you may not lead a company, but at the same time, wherever you are, because we are in a fallen world, we are asked to lead. So whenever you stand up and you witness for Jesus Christ about right and wrong, you are actually doing a leadership role. So this applies to every single one of us. I was listening to someone speak just last week, and this person said that actually the church is like a big hospital. So people come to church and we are healed and we are comforted. I think he got it wrong. If you read the Bible very carefully, as I've preached to you before, the church is not a hospital. The church is an army camp, meaning you are all being equipped to go out there and better for our Lord Jesus Christ. But in an army camp, there is a medical unit, isn't it? Every army camp is the same. You have a clinic at a medical unit. And yes, there are times where we come to church and we need healing, we need to be comforted, and that's a major role of the church as well. But the overwhelming message of the Bible is that every single one of us 
who call Jesus Christ our Lord are his disciples. And we are to go out there and lead in whatever way that God has given to you. Maybe you are a parent, maybe you are a teacher, maybe you are just maybe the lowest ranking person in your company. But still, because the world is so dark and the truth is already given to us, and so whenever we open our mouth and affirm the truth of God, we are leading. And today I want to take this particular topic and expand it a little bit further by looking at the life and the leadership of Moses as we move towards the end of Exodus. So in Exodus 33, we will see one of the attributes of Moses in leadership being expressed. And from there, we can learn what is it that we should do also in our own life. So let's come to God in a word of prayer as we approach Exodus 33. Let's pray together. We thank you, Lord, for leading us here. And we do ask that you give us a heart that is humble and open to you. Many of us come here with a lot of burdens in our life, challenges, and sometimes we are just here because we are asked to come. Whatever the case may be, then help us to set aside all that is blocking us from you, that we may access your throne of grace. And we will hear you, we will recognize your voice, and we will turn and follow you. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and minds be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so after the horrifying episode in chapter 32. Remember what happened? Moses came down, they were all worshipping the golden calf, and Moses said, all who are with God come to me. And so, especially the tribe of Levi all went to Moses. And Moses told them, every single one of you take a sword, go among your brothers to and fro, and kill them all, meaning those people who were against God. And so, a lot of slaughter happened on that day. 3,000 over people who worshipped the golden calf and refused to come to the Lord were slaughtered. And so by that time, a kind of cleansing has happened. And chapter 33 then opened with the Lord commanding them to move forward to the promised land. In verses 1 to 6, the command to leave Sinai for the promised land was given. And God said, I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Parasites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, if you study biblical archaeology, you will find that these were the Gentiles that were living down there, pagan races. And they were living lives that were quite horrifying. For example, in the worshipping of their gods, they would sacrifice children and sacrifice uh, their own wives or human sacrifice. And all kinds of nonsense were happening in all these things. And so one of the things that I sort of mentioned before when we talk about the laws that Moses was given to the people, including health laws, uh, is to prevent them from catching a lot of diseases from all these people. So you're not supposed to intermarry and, and what have you, because this was just a group of people who, if left on their own, would have destroyed themselves anyway. And then God said in verse 3, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, so flowing with milk and honey, this phrase is used quite often in Genesis also, which is a standard Hebrew phrase, which means a land that is very prosperous and has a lot of uh, fertile land. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Now, this is an important phrase. So God said to the Israelites, that now you go to the promised land. I will send an angel to go before you but I myself will not go with you because I will consume you. Remember, we talk about God being consuming fire, right? And how before God, the precise God, there is no iota of sin that's allowable. And so the sons of Aaron was consumed because they got drunk as they were trying to do the sacrifice. And such is the case for us today too. The difference between the God of consuming fire and the God of grace is our Lord Jesus Christ now is the reason why we are not consumed. But back in those days, a very direct situation, and God said that I'm not going to go with you because there's great sin among you. If I go with you and consume you and all of you will die. So therefore, I will send an angel before you. Now, when the Bible uses the word angel, as I preached before, there were interchangeably between the word angel, the messenger of God, and the Lord, right, earlier. But now, this angel is not the same as the one that I was talking about earlier in Exodus 23. In Exodus 23, God said right about the same thing. 
Behold, I will send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. So it seems quite similar, except the verse 21 says this. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name is in him. So this is not the same as now an angel who is just a messenger. So earlier when the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord, the messenger of God, we believe that the angel originally mentioned in the Bible are actually the idea of a Christophany. Let me see. Can I get it right? Yeah, there we go. This is a theological term. Christophany means an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So although the Bible doesn't tell you that it was Jesus Christ who appeared, but because God said, my name is in him, and everything relating to this angel is similar to God. You are to obey him, you are to obey his voice, because my name is with him. So most of us believe that this angel, which is a human word to describe a supernatural, is Christophany, a Jesus Christ appearing in the Old Testament. And there are other examples in the Old Testament for that. For example, Daniel's friend, three friends got thrown into the furnace, right? And then there was a fourth person is inside. And the fourth person is a form of Christophany as well. And so here, God is telling the people that, you know, earlier I promised you that the angel who is like me will follow you, but now no longer. It's just an ordinary kind of an angel. So verse 4 says, When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. Because the people now know that on this trip then, it is no longer God himself or Jesus Christ, the second person in the triune God that will be with us, but a messenger or a ordinary kind of an angel that will be with us. And the people realize, and then they mourn. And the Bible tells us that they started to take away all the bling bling things that they have, ornaments, as they form as a sign of mourning over the great sin that they have committed in chapter 32. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the side lessons learned here is the horrifying situation that happened when the presence of God is no longer there. And we see in chapter 33, presence of God is not there because the people have sinned. Therefore, the impact of sin is a very real thing in our life. In this particular case, the Lord continued to protect the people Israel by sending an angel. But his own presence was no longer there. So it's sort of like a deputy, a second-rate kind of a situation. He sent an angel. And the people recognize it. This reminded me of the way many people live their life today. Now, there are many people in my ministry that I have encountered who really live double and multiple lives, meaning you want to be in church as a Christian, but at the same time, you are actually living a life of sin. And you think that it's okay. And God, the way he treated the Israelites, may be very gracious to you. And yes, God may even send an angel to still protect you. So therefore, a lot of people's lives go on quite well, despite the fact that they actually live a double life. But you know, it is actually very horrifying that the presence of God is no longer with you. And the presence of God cannot be there if you are a person who continually sin. Now again, I'm not saying that we are all perfect people and we will never fall or whatever it is. But there's a lot of difference between wanting to be more and more like Jesus Christ, as Dhamma once prayed earlier, that we want to be more and more like Jesus Christ, and then along the way we fall and we make mistakes and we ask God for forgiveness and we come back, and that's fine. A lot of difference between that and someone who is determined to sort of ignore God in their life and continue to live a life of sin. And they think it's okay. And this is a very horrifying thing, actually, because the presence of God actually is not going to be with you. And so in my ministry, I've seen many people who attempted to do that. And I always tell you, right, if you come to me and you ask me to talk to you and counsel you, two things I will tell you. First thing is confidentiality. Whatever you tell me, you know, my, my lips are sealed because that's my job. My job is to keep quiet. And so you don't have to worry that I'm going to broadcast it to somebody else. And the second thing is almost nothing will surprise me. Almost nothing because I don't want to be 
so sure. So, you know, you tell me all kinds of nonsense. You don't think that pastor will be very surprised and then say, oh, why you are such a person? I think. You know why? Because through ministry, I was ordained as an elder at 33, you know, very young. And so through many decades, at least two decades, I have encountered so many people who actually harbor a lot of sins in their life and then they continue to live on the outward, pretty normal-looking kind of a lifestyle. You know what the problem is? The problem is that then inevitably, God's chastisement will come. And the book of Hebrews says that if God loves you, He will go after you, you know, because you are His beloved child. And people get all confused. And then they ask me, why did this thing happen to me? Why did that thing happen to me? What is the will of God relating to my life when all these strange things happen to me? And I tell you, if you are a person who continue to harbor sin in your life, the answer is very difficult to find. Meaning you want to look back into your life and then you say, why did all these things happen to me? Why is my life so miserable? Whatever it is. Is this the will of God that I suffer this way? I will find it very, very difficult to answer you because I know that you are harboring sins. For example, you have a mistress somewhere that you have it for like donkey years and you hide it from your wife. Or you are a person who engages in massive fraud in your business. Or you are a person who actually is not who you say you are. And then when chastisement come and you come and ask me, how do I explain this? My answer to you is I can't quite tell, you know. Because I don't know whether it's a direct punishment from God with you or not. And so don't do that. As it is, it is true that in life when things happen to us, oftentimes it's very difficult to explain But I want you to live a life where you are trying your best to be more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ and accept that we will fall, but largely quite clear in your conscience before God. And then when you are living your Christian life that way, you will find it much easier to trust God that He will not make a mistake, that He will continue to be good to you and He will continue to love you. But you attempt, as Jesus Christ said, to love the world and love God at the same time. You find it completely confusing because you have no assurance that the presence of God is with you. And so that was the case for the Israelite. The presence of God was not going to be with them anymore. Although God was still gracious, an angel is sent for them. The people already knew. And so they began to mourn. And because they began to mourn, the Bible tells us that Moses wanted to then intervene for them. Verses 7 to 11 talk about how there's a tense of meeting. Now, this is not the tabernacle, which is very complicated kind of a thing, but a temporal kind of a tent before the tabernacle was built. And still the presence of God will be on this tense of meeting where Moses would appear. And next come a very intimate description of the Bible. It's quite rare, actually. Verse 11 tells us, Then God... hmm, I think this thing has no battery or something. Yeah. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is a very rare kind of understanding of the Bible. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So Joshua later on take over from Moses. And this particular verse gives rise to some of the quite lame jokes in the, in the church. Lah. Like, can a nun have a son? The answer is yes. The son's name is Joshua. <laughs> Joshua, the son of nun. Because nun is not supposed to get married. That's because at the wrong pronunciation is not nun. Uh. The Hebrew pronunciation is nun. The Chinese translation is nun. So please don't say that a nun can have a son whose name is Joshua. That cannot be. So Joshua is very faithful and he will follow Moses everywhere he goes. And Moses began to then intervene for the people. And it's a, such a, a, a close intimate description of Moses and that Moses was considered a person who was so close to God that God spoke to him as a man speak to his friend. The Bible only has three characters that are described as friend of God. One is Moses. Who knows who the other one? Abraham. Very good. The second person was Abraham and the third one is one which lesser people know. Lazarus in the New Testament. Because Jesus Christ said, let's go and visit our friend. So a friend of God. Uh, but Moses was quite different in that. The Bible described him in very intimate terms, not only in Exodus, also in Numbers 12.7. 
um, when the people will start to argue about Moses, whether he should be a good leader or all that, God intervened and said, Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in readers. And he beholds the form of the Lord. So this person was very unusual. He was considered a friend of God. And when we think about leadership then, I want to learn and share with you some of the attributes that you can find from Moses, this person, whom we consider as one of the ultimate servant leader. And so from here, I encourage you to learn from the Bible what is it that you need to do in your life as God will ask you to lead wherever you may be. Now, I want to start off by telling you that when we think about Moses, you are to remember that Moses was not just an ordinary person. The New Testament Acts, the mother Stephen, as he related the story of Moses, said this, and Moses was instructed in all the wisdoms of the Egyptian, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. And so many people thought that Moses, because when, when God appeared in the most burning bush calling him, he told God that, you know, I cannot speak, you know, I'm not good at speaking, so please don't ask me to go and lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Like a lot of you guys, lah, huh? every time I ask you to do something, the first thing you tell me, I don't know. I pay hell. I cannot speak one. I'm very paise. I stand in front of people, only I pee in my pants, something like that. You know, Moses said the same thing. But Stephen said, nonsense, not true, because he was prince of Egypt. So he was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. So as a leader, he was already very capable, like many leaders today. But the other thing about Moses that's very unusual was he was also very humble. You know that because the Bible declared it. Numbers 12, 3. Now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And it's found declared in the Bible, Numbers. But you know Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So Numbers would have been written by him. <laughs> So this is a bit like Yong Teng Ming writing a book saying, Yong Teng Ming is the most humble person in the whole of Singapore. <laughs> so can this be counted? <laughs> the answer is yes. Because we believe that the word of the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So therefore Moses, not that he bragged about himself, <laughs> but the Holy Spirit inspired him to have this record. And, he was, and of course, when you read the rest of the Bible, very clearly this Moses was not your ordinary Joe. He was also truly humble. The combination of the two, being really capable and really humble give rise to this phrase, servant leadership, especially in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are a person who is not capable, let's say that you are not rich, kind of dumb, IQ not very high type, never do well, PSLE also fail, and then you are humble, then that humility is quite natural, la, you know what I mean? You, you should be. La. Uh, but if you are very capable, very handsome, very talented, and able to move mountains type, and yet you are humble, then that's true humility. The worst ones are those who are not capable and yet proud at the same time, right? There are people who are like that. And I tell you, church a lot, la. One of the phrases my wife and I always repeat is that church are xiao lang ji tua tua. You know, crazy people are a lot in the church. It really, you know, some people really quite xiao. La. They come here and tell you what to do, especially sermon. La. Some people come and ask me, hey, you know, you, you speak sermon, you should like that, like that, like that, So I say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good. May I know where you graduated from? Uh, no, PSLE also failed. Then how? Uh? I'm not saying that if you fail PSLE, you cannot teach others, right? I mean, the word of God, the truth is the truth is the truth. Where it comes from a child, three-year-old, or from a PhD, is still the truth. But there are really some people who really, they, they don't seem to have any real abilities, but they just go around trying to tell people off, and you know, their, their entire career seems to be to tell people off. It's very strange. True humility is a different ballgame altogether, where you are very capable and you are truly humble. And the combination is very rare. Not only in the church, but certainly in the world today. Now, I, there was a period of time I spent in my life as an engineer, then followed by entrepreneur, so all together, about 20 over years. And you know, when you are an entrepreneur and businessman, you try to read books and what have you, 
And a lot of books are just nonsense. I don't know. Everybody just write books, right? Consultants all over the place. A consultant is a person who take your watch, tell you the time, charge you a fee, and then after that, keep the watch. Let yeah. <laughs> me tell you obvious. But there are a few books that caught my attention. One of them is a book by a guy called Jim Collin. It is called From Good to Great. Very old book. It was published in the year 2001. So why am I interested in this book? This book is a bit unusual because what Collins did was he didn't just tell you what makes a good company. So his, his, his book is called From Good to Great. He wants to tell you how a company can be from good to great. La. That's what the title of the book means. Not just good enough to be just good. You want to be a great company. And so what did he do? He went to investigate, if I'm not mistaken, 11 companies that's listed on the public market in America. Because it's publicly listed, so you can get a lot of information from this company, right? If it's a private limited company, very hard. You can't even know how they operate. So he studied in depth, analyzed, and come out with a whole series of reason why these companies are great companies, how they move from good to great. And so the book became quite intriguing to me because to me, it's kind of a database analysis. So not just because you think of some guru management thing to write about. And as an engineer, I like that part of it. But even he was not accurate because at the end of the day, among the companies that he featured, at least two went belly up. So they were not that great after all. And his answer is, well, they were great when I studied them, but now later gone. In the study of all these great companies, Jim Collins identified one thing among all the great companies. The existence of what he called level five leadership. And that's very interesting because it relates to what we have learning from the Bible today. Collins looked at the world today and all these companies, and he said that the level one leaders in all companies, the level one personnel are highly capable individual among the leaders. Huh? Of course, every company also has a lot of dead wood. You know what dead woods are? People who just hide somewhere, you know, and then collect money and don't know, they actually don't know from where one. But every company has that. Huh? Everyone, including the government, in Singapore government, a lot. Huh? So the dead wood just hide somewhere like, like big bucks in the... And then they try to say, suddenly, hey, how come I, we didn't know you exist in our organization, but you've been taking pay for the past 20 years. But among the leaders, level one, highly capable individual, they make productive contribution to talent, knowledge, skill, and good work habits. So that's the first level of leader that any company will have. The second level of leaders are contributing team members, according to Jim Collin, contribute individual capacities to the achievement of group objective and work effectively with others in the group setting. So the first one is individual. The guy can do very good individual do work. Better than this person is someone who can work in a team, right? Someone is a team builder. Third, competent manager. Organizes people and resources towards the effective and efficient pursuit of predetermined objective. So not only can you contribute in a team, you are a manager of teams. You can get every team together. So that's third level, better. Fourth level, effective leader catalyzes commitment to and vigorous pursuit of a clear and compelling vision, stimulating higher performance standards. So you're effective leader. Not only do you manage the team, now you can lead the team to go forward. So one, two, three, four. These are all like very, quite good, huh? kind of different kind of leader. But Collins identified that all of these leaders are for good companies. So you want your company to be good, you must at least have all these kind of four. But you want your company to be great, you need level five leaders, which is the last group, which are level five executive, built enduring greatness through a paradoxical blend of personal humility and pers professional will. The words are very small, you can't see. So let me read it again. Huh? Level five leaders, built enduring greatness through a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. In other words, a level five leader is a person who is really capable, but at the same time, truly humble. Now, this combination, if your company has people like that, then your company got a chance to be great. But the combination is paradoxical. 
You know, paradox means doesn't look like it, but it is it. Why paradoxical? Because most leaders are not humble, right? So by this definition, is Donald Trump a level five leader? Absolutely out of question, right? Because it's like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, good, I'm the greatest, I'm always greatest, you know. If, I'm the greatest, I'm, if because of me, the whole, whole we got the best of the whole world, the best in history. <laughs> so like, what do you Xiao Lang Ji Tua Tu is one of them. So, I have never find either people who are very capable, but truly humble, uh, not pretend humble, you know. The Chinese uh, pretend humble a lot. Chinese use the word li duo bi zha. That means you, Chinese is like, because I'm very bicultural, right? So one of the things I, I, I always encounter is like, Chinese pastors and Chinese leaders get together. Hey, ni zuo la, ni zuo, ni zuo, ni zuo, wo zuo, wo zuo, ni zuo, ta zuo, ni zuo, wo zuo. I just go down and bong sit first, you know. Yeah, both of us say, you go out, you know, must be humble. You knew, okay, you need to what you see, I see, I see, you see, he see, they see. Chinese do that, right? Then when you gather together and eat also, nobody there to move. Huh? Everybody move, must wait for patong to move the, the chopstick first. So I must always tell myself, wait for patong, wait for patong. Because of Chinese humility, is that humility true? I don't think so. Because after patong leave, everybody tell, hey, you know, just now he like that, like that, like that. True humility, paradoxical, truly humble, and truly capable at the same time. So I say to you again, that you may be humble, right? But you're humble because you no choice, so you're very humble. So you, uh, you know, you're not capable also, so you better keep your mouth shut. At least you're wise, right? So if you are not capable, and proud at the same time, you are also stupid, uh, let me tell you this. Three combination: Lousy, proud, stupid, all combined together. You must be truly, truly capable, and at the same time, from the bottom of your heart, huh? know that actually it's not about me. It's about my team. And so when you lead a team like that, you will truly give the glory to your team members. Right? Not because you write on your hand, remember to, uh, <laughs> to praise your team. Okay, yeah, okay. Oh, this is all my team work. Okay. Then people can tell this is not real. A truly good level five leader, very capable leading the team, all the way, and when you try to praise him, he truly honestly feels that it is the team that come together. But the reality is that without him, it won't happen. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's a very paradoxical and very strange kind of combination that is very, very rare. Because most people, if you are capable, no matter how at the back of my mind, you still think that without me, you'll all die anyway, Right? So you just keep quiet and sit down and don't come and challenge me. Or someone who really thinks that it's a team because he's not capable, so yeah, it's about a team. Right? To be the one who is the reason for success because of your leadership and truly, honestly, from the body of your heart, think that it's about a team, rare combination. And so Jim Collins considered Level 5 executive as the one that will make a company great. But of course, Colin, not a, Christ, not a Christian book. This is a management book. I will tell you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, at least he caught some part of biblical teaching correct. Because the true servant leadership that we can identify in the Bible is definitely seen in our Lord Jesus Christ. And among all the things that the Bible teaches us, right? we know that the Bible tells us that Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus is so humble that he would not take for granted the glory of heaven and he will come for our sake, humbling himself to the lowest. But I say that among all the things that Jesus Christ has done in his life to demonstrate his true humility, the washing of the feet of the disciples will be it. You know, if I get to design the church, uh, I would definitely make sure there's a huge picture of something like this hanging somewhere so that when you enter the door, you will see you know why? Because this is a direct command by our Lord Jesus Christ, seen in John chapter 13. Jesus Christ washed the feet of the disciples and then put on his own garment and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done 
for you. Now, I, I have touched on this topic before when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. He was doing the lowest job, you know, because these people at that time were traveling in dirt road and what have you. So you go enter into somebody's house and the lowest servant or slave or whatever it is will kind of wash your feet to clean away all the dirt and what have you. And Jesus took on that role and he did it most naturally. Now today he has become a richer in some churches during uh, Good Friday or whatever it is, they actually will go and do something like that. Then go and get all the beggars on the street and all that come to the church and then we wash the feet. After that, you can go back to the street and back again. <laughs> so it becomes pretty ritualistic. But not so for Jesus Christ. He was absolutely, completely humble. And, and of course, Jesus is the most capable of all people, right? And for him to demonstrate that humility to us, I do believe it's very, very important because he said that, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And so true humility is a mark of the Christian. In the same chapter, later then he talked about how Judas will betray him. And the great commandment, a new commandment, come in the same chapter after he demonstrated this in action. And that is found in John 13.34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. This we all know. Very familiar verse. We will love one another. New commandment given by Jesus Christ. Next verse is a verse that few people would remember, which is verse 35 that says, By this, all people will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is a verse that many people do not remember. So, how do people know that you are Christian? Is it because you build a big church? Is it because you are very successful in life? Is it because, I don't know, you go and write some social ills or whatever it is? I mean, all these are good things, I suppose. But the Bible never ever said that people will know that you are Christian because your church is very powerful and very big and you got this biggest building in the whole of your country. No. The Bible says, by this, our Lord Jesus Christ said, All people will know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. And so the true humility was demonstrated. And it is a very tough thing to do. And the Bible calls for us to aspire to that level of true servant leadership. How difficult it is, one of the sayings demonstrates this, that if you want to find out whether someone is a true servant leader, then treat him like a servant and see how he reacts. I'm not saying you should treat me like a servant. I'm, I'm just teaching you first. Huh? <laughs> if to see a person truly understand servant leadership, treat him like a servant and then you see how he reacts. And it's a very tough thing for those of you who may be called into full-time ministry. If you are a true servant leader, this is something you need to learn because servanthood means you serve. And the Bible has a verse that is actually quite horrifying. Jesus Christ said in Mark, Chapter 6, verse, in Mark chapter 6, it, Mark chapter 6 describes what happened when Jesus went to do a lot of healing in Capernaum. And then he returned to Nazareth. He ran away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples then followed him. So can you imagine he do all the healing, right? So big deal. A lot of people know him, very famous. And, and outside of, of Nazareth, big deal. And then he came back to Nazareth. This is recorded in Matthew and also in the Gospel of Luke. And on the Sabbath day, he began to teach in a synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get all these things? What is his wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? So Jesus went back to his own hometown and he taught. And the people continued to say, Is this not the disciple carpenter? I thought he's the son of Mary, right? He's a brother of James and John and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. And they took offense at him. They were angry with him, although he has done so much work outside of Nazareth. And this is the first. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. I have pondered often about this verse. And this reflects what servant leadership is all about. That if you want to aspire to be at the greatest area of service in the ministry of God, you must be prepared 
to receive no thanks. Even from your own cell group, your own church, your own family, even your spouse. Because Jesus Christ declared, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And you know, Jesus Christ cannot be wrong. And so for those of you who are called into ministry, this is something you must be prepared to do. That you must be prepared to serve without thanks. And so, you know, if all these accolades and all the praises of that matter a lot to you, you will find ministry to be most difficult. Because, as the English saying goes, familiarity breeds, what? Contempt. That means you're too familiar with each other because the pastor is here all the time. He's always there. Familiarity breeds contempt. And Jesus cannot be wrong, you know. So, of course, we know that we need to honor our leaders and the servant of God, the humble two hands, you know. And the, I would say the Indonesian church do that a lot better than many churches. Nonetheless, the fact is that the sum average of experiences of servant leadership must be one which appreciation is not natural because Jesus already declared that. So it's a truly humble situation. And Moses was a person absolutely like that because scripture already declared it in Numbers chapter 12. The other thing we learn from Moses is that this true servant leader was also a person who was truly with the people. And this is an important thing to see in Moses. As a leader, he was very unusual among all leaders. Exodus 32, when all the mess happened, they go and worship the golden calf, right? And God told Moses that I'm going to consume all of them. What did Moses do? Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? He did not tell God, Wow, those people all kaisu, uh, go and kill them all. Very good. Kill them, all these horrible sinners. He did not. He, in fact, he spoke out for his people. And he turned to the Lord and said, Alas, these people have seen a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. And he understood that God is going to destroy them. You know what Moses said in the earlier chapter, verse 32? But now, if you will forgive their sin, please forgive them. If not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. So God, you're going to destroy these people, right? I'm their leader. So please, remove me from the salvation as well. Now, this is a true identification with the people, which is very, very rare and lacking today. And even in the time of Moses. Because when he was away, who was in the lead? Aaron, right? In contrast, what did Aaron say? Exodus 32, 21, when Moses went after Aaron, Moses said to Aaron, hey, what did you do? Huh? What did these people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, right? These people are set on evil. So, not my fault. Because they are set on evil. Because they said to me, Make us God who will go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. We do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, you know, you will go through into the fire and suddenly this calf come out. <laughs> so in contrast with Moses, this Aaron is a really horrible leader. But Aaron is a leader very common. Even in Singapore, right? What did the SMRT guy say, the CEO? When we were asked, after five years of being in a job, guy got three stars on his shoulder last time in the army, top of the rank, and then got hired CEO. Then asked, how come uh, you in charge five years with it? Like, the thing still break down. No? Huh? Cannot stuck here and there. Journalists very upset because, you know, I cannot stuck. Why? What did he say? He said, you know, la, this place got deep cultural issue. <laughs> cultural issue, the people's fault. Like, you know these people, right? You know, you know the people all the are saying, you know? Ask him to go and tie the thing properly, never tie properly. Ask him to go and do anyhow press a button, anyhow press a button. It's all their fault. Got nothing to do with me, you know. Is that leadership? After five years, hey, hello, we pay you how much? Huh? Don't know how many million a year. Eh? After five years, pay me. Lah, I, at least I'll take the blame. It's my fault, lah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me, you know, when I was working in Apple, one of the jobs I did was to take care of component quality, right? 
所以 component quality no good 啊。And you 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 have to call in the supplier and then you tell the supplier, hey, hello, what is this? Ah, you know, you cause my line to go down. All that. There was this guy I met. He has a perfect sales. Skill. His name is Roy Sim. I always remember his name, Roy Sim. Roy Sim's trick is this: when you call me, you look at you and say, "Yeah, lah, it's my fault, lah. Scold me, lah. Scold me, lah. Scold me, lah. <laughs> Scold you for what? My life is going down. Yeah, you lah. Know, I know it's my fault. It's my fault. That was Roy Sim's trick, you know. With that, he can ta tian xia, you know, no problem. You know? <laughs> get promoted all the way to marketing manager. So good trick for you all to learn, lah. Uh, but at least he didn't blame the people, lah. Right? He didn't say, you know, those Japanese, ah, they make the part horrible. He didn't. He just said, "Scold me, lah. It's my fault." You know, <laughs> you know these people, they are set on that, on evil. Moses was not like that. Moses was prepared to go in and said, "I'm going to take responsibility because I'm truly with the people." And our Lord Jesus Christ, of course, was the same. So earlier, Brother Edwin read for us. One of my favorite favorite passages in the Bible, and that is John chapter ten, when Jesus declared that truly I am the door of the sheep. This is such a precious passage to me. You know, I keep reading it all the time. All who came before me, Jesus said, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. And it's precious to me because here you see a very close, intimate identity between Jesus Christ and His people. The people identify with the shepherd, and the shepherd call out to the sheep, "I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be safe and will go in and out and find pasture." And this is my favorite verse, right? John ten ten. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. If you ask me, you know, what are some of the key verses in the Bible that influence me greatly? John ten ten. I have come. That they may have life, not only have life, have it abundantly. And then Jesus went on to describe, "I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd will then lay down his life for the people and for the sheep." And it's such a wonderful description. He's a good shepherd. He's going to lay down his life for his sheep. And then in contrast, verse twelve: He who is a hired hand, another shepherd. Who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and zao first, and leave the sheep and the fleece, and the wolf will snatch them, and he will scatter them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. A true servant leader is one who is with the people truly, not because he is paid to do so. And so it is true that in the church today. You do have two sorts of leaders: those who are true servant leaders, shepherd people, and those who are hired hands. And you know, as a pastor, one of the biggest insult that people can give to you is that you are hired hand. You are hired hand. You know why? Because it's true. A lot of pastors are hired hand, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. One of the reasons is because they are hired hand because they are hired lah. You know, <laughs> they are hired hand. So I, before here. I was a Presbyterian elder for the longest time. I sit in the synod of the Presbyterian Church Executive Committee, and one of the job is to hire people. You know, so the, whatever Presbyterians don't have a pastor, you hire. So like like everybody else, you pull out an ad, you know. Uh, but church have internal kind of network ad. So people come and then they sit before you, and when I was sitting down and interviewing, it's like everybody else. They say, well, "What do you do?" I kind of think, oh, you know. So you assess the person, and the pastor will ask you back, you know. So what are your terms? What kind of benefit you have? Got car or not? Got parsonage or you not? Know? Parsonage is a place for pastor leave. Ah, uh. sabbatical leave or you not? Know? What's the pay? Ah, uh? kind of thing. Uh. Got retirement benefit or you not? Know? So it, it, the system is like that. So without a doubt, then you will then end up having people who are higher hands. And so if the church cannot afford to pay you further. No money and whatever, then you go and look for another church that can pay you better, lah. And you have higher hand. And so sometimes I keep thinking about church structure. The brethren church may have an answer to this. In the brethren church, there are no full timers. They don't hire full timers, and the church is run by elders who are elected among the people who all have their own jobs. And I'm thinking about this for quite a long time. I think that seems to be quite make some sense, you know. But of course, the Bible has full time people too. That the Bible says you are not to muzzle the ox, ah, so it's a very difficult topic. And of course, doesn't mean that 
you should tell your pastor, hey, you are the shepherd, so we don't pay you. No, if you take my pay, means you are higher hand. It's quite complicated. But the Bible is very clear. A true blue servant leader truly, truly cares for the people. This is very different from a secular world. So Jim Collins, level five leader, will leave when the time comes. Because it's a company, why would I be so loyal to you? It's not my company, right? Uh, you have read in the newspaper, Apple's designer is going to leave. Johnny Eve. Guy has been with Apple how many years? 30 years. And we always talk about Apple, you always think about Steve Joe, right? Big deal. Actually, not Steve Joe, no. It's this Johnny Eve guy, no. Because he's the one who designed the iMac. He's the one who designed the iPhone and everything. All Job does is to open his mouth and sell. You know? The guy is a true blue seller. When we were working with Apple Computer, one of the saying is called the PDF. PDF of Steve Job. Personal distortion field of Steve Job. Apparently, if you come within one meter of Steve Job, uh, you enter into his PDF, personal distortion field. He can sell you anything and you will buy. <laughs> That's how good he is. So he's a seller. He's not a true blue designer. So the Johnny Eve guy is going to leave after 30 years. For what purpose? To start his own company. He love called Love From, his next design company. So those level five leaders in the commercial world are there because you pay them. And it's quite stupid also to be loyal to a public listed company because it's not yours, right? But in the case of the Bible, a servant leader is the one who's truly linked with the people. And Jesus Christ is the best example of them all. And the verse ends with John 10, 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And such an intimate understanding. May we aspire to be leaders like that, where we are truly with the people, and as Jesus Christ knows the sheep, may we know the people that we are influencing or shining the light upon in our life in a real and genuine level. So a true servant leader is truly humble. A true Servant leader is a person who is truly with the people. And lastly, I want to say that the true servant leader is one who is truly, truly with God. And verses 12 to 16, we see Moses pleading for God not to leave the people. And it worked in verse 14. And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now again, I don't want to go into the interplay of how God works, but this is something that we see in the Bible, that Moses pleaded, and God allowed the pleading of Moses to be displayed as effective. So Moses managed to achieve his goal here as a leader for his people. So God is not, no longer going to send just any kakia, small fry private um, angel to lead the people, but that the Christophany presence of God himself will go. So God said, I, I, I will do this. I will be with your people. And so the people are all very relieved. And so Moses had done that. And then Moses went in to ask for something else that is unique in the Bible. Verse 18, And Moses then said to God, Teng, Please show me your glory. And this is very unusual in the Bible. And it also displays, although it's just one verse, huh, it display something that is most unusual. That the servant leader Moses knew that his main task or major task in life is to lead the people Israel. But his desire more than anything in life is to be with God. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I will say the same to you today. That you know, my work is to provide guidance and to lead wherever I am. But if you were to ask me what is the deepest desire I have, the answer is to say goodbye to all of you and not to be bothered with you and to be with God. That must be the highest desire of every Christian. And the Apostle Paul says that often you know, in his writing, that, you know, I, I work so hard with you, but you ask me, I would rather with God immediately. And this is a consistent teaching in the Bible. Jesus Christ, when praying for the people 
in John 17 say, I do not ask for this only, but also for those who will believe in me through their words, the disciples, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, and you, they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus said, the ultimate goal for every single one of us is to be one with God, exactly as what Dharma one prayed earlier. They will become closer and closer and closer to be our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you do not understand this, I think you have missed the main part of what Christianity is all about. Of course, we are saved from our sin. For what purpose? That we may be one with God. And so every Christian's desire must be to be with God. To be one with God. And to have this very personal relationship with God, the way Jesus Christ has with his sheep. And now on top of that, of course, God will then give you work to do. You are to be witness to the world, so in love of the world, whatever. And that's every single one of us are different. But the ultimate desire must be to be with God. And so Moses displayed that. Right after he achieved his earthly goal, he immediately went after and, and told God, I want to see you. I want to be with you. May I encourage you to understand this deeply. And you have a personal, personal relationship with your God. You are going to love God more than you love the person who is closest to you. Maybe it's your spouse, your children, whatever. Because it is about that relationship. And if you don't have that relationship with God, may I encourage you to have it. Because Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I have come for you. I am the door. And he's inviting you to open up your heart to him. And it is, that's what it's all about. Everything else is just built upon that basic relationship. And the true servant leader understands that. And so God was very gracious to Moses. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. Remember there was a period of time we keep talking about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, right? This very mystical and very complex description of God. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and show mercy on whom I show mercy. But God said to Moses, you cannot see my face for men shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft, that means in a, in a gap of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. These words does not mean that God has a back or God has a face or God has a hand. They are just human words to describe the glory of the God passing by, that if Moses was to witness it face to face, he would be struck dead because God is a consuming fire. And so it is all descriptive and anthropomorphic in nature, meaning human words, to describe how the glory of God will pass by Moses and Moses get to glimpse the glory of God. From this particular passage came the wonderful verse just now, which is seen in the video anthem, Rock of Ages cleft for me, written by the Reverend Augustine Top Lady in 1775. This Reverend was going somewhere to preach and in you know, those days they would ride horses. And it was a big storm and then he got to hide in a, in a cleft of a hill and all of a sudden he remembered Exodus 33 and so he wrote, Rock of Ages cleft for me. It was not just a rock, it was a pre- cast or pre-representation of Jesus Christ, the rock, whose body is broken for us so that we may hide inside as the glory of God and His awesomeness appear before us. So he wrote, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may we too be people who are found in the cleft of the rock of ages. For Jesus Christ is the good shepherd and he calls us to have a relationship with him. And may we continue to lead wherever we are 
in whatever capacity that God has placed to us, truly being the salt and light of the world. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for the example of Moses, whom the Bible described as a friend of God, that he was a person who was so capable and yet truly humble and truly was with the people and ultimately truly desired to be with you. May we live lives in the same manner as well, knowing that there's nothing better than being with you. In the meantime, while we are still on earth, you have given us tasks to do, to be your salt and light of the world, to lead in this place where everybody is harassed and helpless, like sheep without shepherd. And you've called us to be their shepherd, to lead them back to the good shepherd. May we learn all these precious lessons and apply them in our life so that we too can live the life and live it abundantly. Help us, O oh God, for we are often stiff-necked and weak. But with men, things seem impossible. But with you, everything is possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.